Shalom Yisrael unto the Gentiles that profess unto truth of Messiah. Welcome to another Shabbat study. Um, uh, today I want to talk about um, something that I was uh, dealing with on social media and I did a video that, uh, on TikTok that three things that the Christian church can't tell you about prayer and obviously um, that's got a lot of views and a lot of comments um, it's got uh, some people really upset um, accusing me of legalism um, and asking me for evidence or scriptures obviously I said in the video that um, I'll provide evidences in YouTube because you can't rush that type of teaching you just I just wanted to give uh, I just wanted to sow a seed and then I wanted to uh, do a proper teaching going through some scriptures and giving you some scriptures to read for yourself uh, for you really shouldn't believe anything I say you should be studying the scriptures for yourself so um there's been some ongoing dialogue with some with some Christians um, I think another person turned around and said they only want to see scriptures from the New Testament well we have scriptures from the old and the new and lost books. Um, I think somebody else said uh, it sounds like Islam. Where do you think they got it from? You know, they had our Torah first, and when you understand Torah and they have the Book of Psalms, you know, these books contain these practices and the prophets. Um, so I want to deal with this today, but let's start with prayer. Avinu, Sheba Shemayim, Git Kadesh Shemka, Tabu Malkuteka, Gay Aseret Sonka, Ka Ashe Keba Shemayim Gamba Aret, Tainlanu et Lekem Zad Kainu Hayom, U Mikalanu et Kobetainu, Kimoshi Gama Naknu, Makalnu, Le Kayavainu, Wa Altivi Ainu, Lide Nisayon, Ela Hazi Lainu Min Hara. Kishal kahi ha malkut wa ha gavora wa ha tefira le olme olamin amen bashem yehoshua. Barukata yehoah sevaot bore ha shemayim wa ha aret. Blessed are you, Yehovah of hosts, the creator of heaven and earth. Elohe Yeshua tainu, the Elohim va salvation. Elohe Abraham, Yitzchak, wa Yisrael, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Baruch Shemka Yehoshua HaMashiach HaBokir. Blessed is your name, Yehoshua the Messiah, the elect one. Melech Melekim Adonai Adani, King of Kings, a master of masters. Melech HaKavod, King of Glory. Salak Lanu Kokotainu Na Yehoshua Bavakusha. Forgive us all our sins, I beseech you, Yehoshua, please. Rafenu na Yehovah. Heal us, I beseech you, Yehovah. And um, pour out your Ruach HaKodesh even upon us. Temelenu Baruach HaKodesh. Bless this study, Most High. Let people's hearts be opened. O oh, Yehoshua, visit those who are open to these teachings and bless their prayer life in Yehoshua's name. I pray and give thanks. Hallelujah. Amen. So guys, you know, I'm still learning Hebrew really early stages. So I'm going to pray some Hebrew, speak a few words. Um, that's why we break, I broke into English as well. But you see, what I want to teach on today is a Hebraic understanding of prayer. Like when you come out of uh, the Christian church and into, the, into Israel, into the Messianic Hebrew faith, the truth, you start to realize there's there's more to our faith. It's an ancient path that Jeremiah speaks about. Um, if you look at the, our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Hanok, Adam, um, Sheth, Enosh, Methuselah, Yered, Mahalalel, like these guys had their prayers answered um, and then we go to the prophets obviously then we've got the apostles and Yehoshua himself 
they had a way of praying is what I call a prescription and I think and I believe Israel and the Christian church have gone away from it completely I think with the Christian church you have to do what you want otherwise if you have to do some type of structural thing it's legalism there's some Old Testament practices that Christians still do believing it's just new covenant so then how are we going to say everything's legalism? And I'm not saying what I'm going to teach today is law. I'm telling you this is just a prescription. And I'm here to edify, to help bring more power to your prayer life, not to restrict it. Not to say there's only one way. In fact, there's more than one way. But there's an anointing in a direction. There's an anointing at specific times. There's an anointing, depending on the situation, of a position. Okay? There's different ways to pray. But there's a specific anointing at a specific time. And this is what I'm trying to get you to understand. But there's no need for you to be offended by these things. Because we're going to prove all things with the scriptures. Like some of the Old Testament practices that Christians still do. And don't, don't cry legalism. You pray. Prayers from the beginning of time. And prayer is repetitive. It, it should be structural. Um, meaning that there's a way to pray. And Yahushua revealed that in Matthew 6. And some people say, oh, you, sh you don't need to pray those words. Of course, you should be praying those words. They asked him very literally. Teach us to pray. Out of that, you can build your prayer life. Definitely, there's a method to it. But those words are great foundational prayers you should be saying those prayers or that prayer um so worship prayer and worship old testament but not ritualistic but they are ritualistic rituals are not bad we have been brought up being taught that rituals are bad rituals are not bad rituals are good holy rituals are good having a ritualistic lifestyle is powerful you got people in the world that are ritualistic about their day, about motivation, about business, and they're successful. So if you have holy rituals in your life, you're going to be successful in the most high. Um, tithes and offerings. Christian, Christians have no problem paying tithes and offerings. That's Old Testament law. Immersions, Old Testament, Book of Numbers. So all of these things... People are still doing, but now when we want to talk about prayer and edifying prayer, because I want your prayers to be answered. I want, your, I want you to experience more power. We're talking about legalism now. So we want to, we want to cut to the chase um, and we want to get into the study. But let, let's, uh, the, I think the second book of Ezra, I'm going to read um, chapter 12, verse 35 to 38. This is the dream that you saw, and these are the interpretations. You only have been me to know the secret of El Elyon. Therefore, write all these things that you have seen in a book or in a scroll, and hide them, and teach them to the wise of the people, whose heart you know may comprehend and keep these secrets. You see, there are some things that are publicly given to us by the most time for the whole world to observe and to be involved in but there's certain secrets of wisdom which he hides and those who are truly seeking him in the ruach and the met that's in the spirit and in the truth they get these hidden secrets and these hidden gems so when we bring a teaching about prayer and <clears throat> certain methods of praying instead of thinking or immediately thinking legalism we need to be thinking this is a secret that's being revealed in these last days so be patient before you make your judgments but even for those who are new those who are coming into Israel the experienced ones this is to help our prayer life and we know uh, Yehoshua taught the disciples how to pray in Matthew 6. 
Um, let's all let's let's start with, in fact, Revelation chapter five. The book of Revelation, Hit Galut, chapter five, verse eight. Yeah, Yehoshua gave a method of praying, but one of the things he said is be private about it, don't boast about it. And that's an important part of prayer. I'm going to get that in now, because I'm, uh, I'm not boasting about anything. I'm saying, yeah, prayer is a private event, really. There's a time for corporate prayer, obviously, in congregations. But um, prayer is a private thing. Close the door. That's what we're talking. Go into a secret place. Okay, Revelation chapter 5. Verse 8 And when he had taken the book The four beasts And four and twenty elders Fell down before the lamb That's Yehoshua Having every one of them harps And golden vials Full of odours Which are the prayers of the saints Revelation chapter 8 And when he had opened the seventh seal There was a silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before Elohim, and to them were given seven trumpets. And to another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which is before the throne. The imagery we are given about prayer, you just pray and then goes up into the sky. That's the imagery we're given by church or Christianity. We have some clear evidence in Revelation 5a and Revelation 8 verses 1 uh, to 3. In fact, let's read verse 4. And the smoke of the incense which came up with the prayers of the saints ascended up before Elohim out of the angel's hand. So the when you are praying, your prayers are carried first. You need to understand this from a Hebraic perspective. Your prayers are carried up by angels. When you start speaking towards the Most High, there needs to be an acknowledgement in your spirit that you are in the company of angels. And that's going to freak some of you out. Because you're like, what? Angel worship? No one's saying angel worship. That's another thing people start leaning towards, thinking, oh, angels, oh, no, no one's talking about angel worship. You just need to know that in your presence, as soon as you start praying, which is a deep spiritual sacrifice, angels are present. We all have our own angels, by the way, too. When Kepha was locked, uh, locked up in prison and he escaped, he was knocking on the door in the book of Acts. And the person who wants to answer the door was like, looked and said, what? It can't be careful, it must be his angel. So we have angels. So you need to understand, you need to be aware and you need to understand uh, of your surroundings. So what happens? Angels carry up our prayers and those prayers reach a specific place in heaven. All right, they go up with an angel towards an altar, which is before the throne of the Most High. And then a golden censer is given to an angel and he fills it with incense. This is going to be frankincense. So our prayers alone, coming out of our voice, like from what we understand, it's just not like what's happening in the spiritual realm, in the invisible realm. Physically, we're speaking our prayers to the Most High in private. Angels carry up to the altar of the Most High. They have golden censers in their hands. And they offer up our prayers because our prayers go to an altar. And that's where you need to understand the temple. I'm going to do a video on the temple next week and concerning the feasts. Maybe in a few days because the feasts begin in like literally five to six days time. We're now in Feast of Trumpets. So I want to do an overview showing the temple and how the feasts are linked to it. So what we have here is we have our prayers reaching 
the altar, frankincense offered. And then when frankincense has been offered unto the prayers, then it ascends before Elohim out of the hand of an angel. This is what we need to understand about prayer. This is why we need to be careful about complaining and murmuring. Can you imagine you are murmuring about your life in an unrighteous way in prayer to the Most High? An angel carry that, you're going to carry that murmuring. You're going to carry that murmuring, spring, sprinkle some frankincense on it. And then that's going to reach the Most High. We need to be very careful about what comes out of our mouth and we're warned consistently about that in the book of James. Even Yehoshua himself, we're warned about it consistently in Proverbs. We need to think about what, we, what we're saying to the Most High. I think when you start acknowledging the process of what's happening in the invisible realm, you then start to become more fearful of Him. And we need to have the fear of Yah in our life. So, uh, even if we read uh, verse 5 from chapter 8. <clears throat> and the angel took the censer, filled it with the fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. <clears throat> so this is speaking about a time to come. You know, this is actually speaking to probably about these days. Because we're going to be going through so much tribulation. Our prayers are going up before the Father to save us, to deliver us. And the earth going to have to come under judgment for our sakes. So, now you're understanding that there's a process to prayer. And there's a ritual behind it in the spiritual realm. So, yeah. It's ritualistic. It's not legalistic. It's ritualistic. Every single time we offer up prayers, it's reaching the altar in heaven before the throne. Before it ascends to the Most High, it's got to have some frankincense attached to it. That's what's happening. That's the book of Revelation. Hallelujah. The word for, the word for prayer in Hebrew is uh, tefillah. And it's rooted in a word called um, palal. So palal means like uh, to intervene, uh, to interpose. So like it's like a request we we're making of the Most High to intervene in a situation. Okay, so when we look at the word tefillah, we're looking at it from a perspective of like, we need you to intervene in our life. We need you to intervene in our fleshly lives. We need a breakthrough in certain circumstances in our life. We need deliverance, salvation, Yeshua, that is. So this is how we, we look at prayer. Intervention from the Most High. In order for intervention to happen, He's got to be pleased also with us. Yeah, you, you've got to offer up prayer with a righteous sacrifice. That in today's speaking is faith and the only way to please him is faith Hebrews 11 so when you offer up your prayers you've got to offer it up with, a, with faith and as you offer it up with faith then it reaches the, the altar then the frankincense hits the prayers then it ascends to the most high and he receives it as, a, as, a, as an offering. Then we're looking at Yehoshua to execute judgment. Then we're looking at Yehoshua to answer our prayers. Hallelujah. So this, this is how we need to see and this is how we need to, to look at prayer. Um, let's go to Luke, Luke 18 uh, briefly. It's one of my favorite parables. Luke chapter 18. Uh, let's go to... Uh, yeah, let's start from verse 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought to always to pray and not to faint. Don't give up. Always pray. It's a ritual. Saying, therefore, was in a city a judge which feared... Not Elohim, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, 
avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not Elohim, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Adon said, Hear what the unjust judge says, and shall not Elohim avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth. Your prayers have to be mingled with faith. And guess what? Faith of a mustard seed is all it takes. Okay, so um, that gives you an idea of how prayer looks. So, um, Yehoshua says we should always pray, not give up. So let's go to the book of Hanok. We're going to go to the book of Hanok. I'm going to a lost book first. The second book of Hanok, The Secrets of Enoch, chapter 13. And we are going to read from uh, verses 2, two Enoch. 13 verse 88 okay it is good to go to the house of Yahweh in the morning and in the eve in sorry let me start again it is good to go to the house of Yahweh in the morning and in the afternoon and in the evening to praise the creator of all for every breathing thing praises and glorifies him every creature visible and invisible Blessed is the man who opens his mouth to praise, to glorify Yahweh with his whole heart. Hallelujah. So Enoch's prescription is three times a day to go to the house of the Most High. And we know that we're the temple now. Of the Ruach HaKadosh, the temple of Elohim. Uh, Psalm 27. Let's go to Psalm 27 uh, verse 4. So now we want to go to, the, to David. What did David have to say? What did David do? One thing I have desired of Yahweh that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of Yahweh all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of Yahweh and to inquire in his temple. So the temple becomes important and prayers released out of this temple. Psalm 55 verse 17. Evening, morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. Paul said pray without ceasing. Okay, let's go to uh, Daniel 6, 10. So the first thing I'm trying to teach you about prayer has been actually understand what's happening in, in the invisible realm. The second thing, which and around you and in heaven, so around you, the angelic realm, and then in heaven, the angelic realm and the most high. The second thing that you're learning today is the frequency of prayer. Okay? And I'm saying, according to the scriptures, that is going to be three times a day. Enoch is the first um, witness. The second witness is going to be... Uh, sorry, the second witness was David through the psalm, Psalm 55. And now we're going to go to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house... And his windows opened up his chambers towards Jerusalem. Remember what I've just said, towards Jerusalem. And he kneeled upon his knees, remember that too, three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his Elohim as he did a four times. So he always did this. So Enoch, David, David, Daniel, three times a day. This is a prescription. Okay, let's now go to uh, 2 Corinthians. 
I know some of you are thinking, man, can we get into the New Testament with this? The second book of Corinthians, chapter 12. Um, this is the visitation that Paul had in paradise. Let's read from verse 6. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he sees me to be, or that he hears of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan debuffed me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Verse 8. For this thing I besought Adonai thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness most gladly. Therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of my Shiach may rest upon me. Hallelujah. He asked the Most High three times. Now he could have said, I asked him multiple times. I asked him many times. But he said, I besought him three times. Well, there's two to three witnesses that needed to be established. But going by what we've seen in Daniel and Enoch and in, um, and in the Psalms through David, they prayed three times a day, morning, afternoon and evening. So which leads me to my next point, which again was controversial to some. You can pray, I'm going to say it from the beginning, any time of the day. It's very clear in the scriptures. Midnight hour, late hours, early hours. However, there was a morning sacrifice and evening sacrifice in the scriptures. Where in the Old Testament, the smoke offerings went before the Most High. So these were called the morning and the evening sacrifices. Okay. So what I'm saying here is that, and there was a sacrifice of, of time of prayer in the afternoon as well. So the three, three times a day, I believe, according to the scriptures, and this is not opinion, this is looking at the scriptures, that the three times a day that you can pray, there's a specific anointing. There's a specific blessing and revelation and supernatural activity during these hours. And they are the third, the sixth and the ninth hour of the day. So looking at 6 a.m. being the first hour, the third hour would be 9 a.m. The sixth hour would be midday and the ninth hour would be 3 p.m. Evening sacrifice. Some of you might say 3 p.m. is afternoon. Come to Africa. And when it's around 3 p.m., 4 p.m., people start saying to you, good evening. It's a different culture from the West. You've got to come out of a Western mindset when you're reading the scriptures. You need Hebraic, Eastern mindset when you're reading the scripture. And that's where you've got to ask the Ruach HaKodesh to help you renew your mind. Romans 12. So three times a day is a prescription, minimum. We know David says, I will praise you seven times. Okay. But three times a day is a prescription to pray. And I believe those three times, the third and the sixth and the ninth hour. I'm going to show you this now in the Old Testament and I'm going to show you in the New Testament. And I'm going to show you through Yehoshua's death. And I'm, uh, yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to show you. Now let's go then to um, 2 Chronicles 13. 2 Chronicles. Okay, from Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, chapter 13, verse 11. But as for us, oh, let's go from verse 10. But as for us, Yahweh is our Elohim, and we have not forsaken him, and the priests which minister unto Yahweh are the sons of Aharon, and the Lewiim wait upon their business. And they burn unto Yahweh every morning and every evening, burnt sacrifices and sweet incense and showbread also set they in order upon the pure table and the candlestick of gold with the lamps thereof to burn every evening for we keep the charge of Yahweh our Elohim 
but ye have forsaken him. So remember that the temple is an earthly picture of what's in heaven. We know that the altar is there already because we read it in the book of Revelation. So we know that the evening and the morning sacrifices. Okay, I wanted to show that. Let's go to Psalm 141, verse 2. Let's read from verse 1. Yahweh, I cry unto thee, make haste unto me, give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set before thee as incense. Revelation 8, Revelation 5, 8. And the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So David here is saying that his prayer should be as the evening sacrifice. So he's clearly linking his prayer to time as well. He wouldn't speak about that in midnight, but there's a specific time to pray. All right. Again, just to reiterate, I'm not saying you can't pray any other time. Of course you can. But there's a specific blessing and anointing available in the third and the sixth and the ninth hour and there's supernatural activity happening in those hours. All right. We're going to read. Uh, OK, I'm not even going to go there, but go to 1 Kings 18.36. This is the battle of um, the prophets of Baal and Eliyahu, Elijah. And that is a time of evening sacrifice where um, Eliyahu makes his prayer and the Most High answers him by fire. That's supernatural activity in the Old Testament. Okay, so let's go to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, you're going to go to chapter 2 verse 15. So this is on the day of Shavuot or Pentecost if you want to use Greek but we prefer to use Hebrew Shavuot. But I realize many Christians are going to be watching this broadcast or people that are new into the faith so I'm trying to help you like um, transition seems to be a very popular word these days but transition out of Christianity into a higher truth. Christianity has some truth the Hebrew Israelite uh, messianic way of life is the truth. So, yeah, the book of Acts. We're going to go to the book of Acts, chapter 2. The day of Shavuot. Acts 2. And let's go to verse uh, 13. Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. But Kepha, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Yehuda." And all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. The third hour of the day. They were meeting in the upper room. Because if you go to verse 1, where we, that's how we get context of the scriptures. We don't isolate. Okay, I'm using verses, but we, we've got to take it by chapters. So go to verse 1. And when the day of Shavuot was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the house and they were sitting. So they met in the third hour. It's an anointed hour. Temple sacrifice. They would have met in the third hour and the Ruach HaKodesh came on the day of Shavuot fulfilling one part of Joel's prophecy, Joel 2, and filled the saints of the Most High. This happened in the third hour, as we have read in verse 15. It, they're not drunk, it's the third hour of the day. Let's look at the sixth hour. So I've shown you the third hour of the day. Um, let's look at the sixth. Let's look at um, Acts 10, the book of Acts. Let's uh, go to verse... Uh, 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Kepha went up upon the housetop to pray. Kepha went up to pray about the sixth hour, midday. He's chosen a specific hour to go and pray. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. He had a supernatural visitation. In the sixth hour. Okay. 
That's Acts 10 9. Acts 26 13. Okay, let's go from. This is uh, Paul speaking to King Agrippa. Let's go to verse 11. And I punish them often in every congregation. This is Paul, okay? So I've shown you Kepha and Paul now. <clears throat> and I punish them often in every congregation and compel them to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Whereupon I went to Damask, Damask, and with authority and commission from the chief priests. Verse 13, pay attention. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining around me and them which journeyed with me. And we, and when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying, in the Hebrew tongue, Shaul. Some people say Yehoshua didn't speak Hebrew, only spoke Aramaic or Greek. Strange. He's saying in the Hebrew tongue, Shaul, Shaul, why persecute thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the bricks. This is at midday, the sixth hour. Supernatural occurrences during prayer for Kepha. And now also, Paul, the Most High, appeared before him at midday on his way to Damascus. He could have appeared any time on that way, but he chose the sixth hour to, to appear. Hallelujah! We're learning something. <coughs> so we have um, the third hour, which I've shown in the Old Testament. Now I'm showing you the New with the book of Acts. The sixth hour, what about the ninth? Let's go to Acts 3 1. Showing you through the lost books as well. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Kepha and Yochanan, so that's Peter and John, went up together into the temple. This is book of Acts. This is after Yahushua's ascension. They went up, this is after the Ruach HaKodesh has come, okay? Now Kepha and Yochanan went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. It can't get any more clearer than this. At the hour of prayer, there's a specific hour of prayer or hours of prayer. The ninth is one of them. The ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. It was a common thing. This is our cultural history of, of Hebrew Israelite faith. Who seen Kepha and Yochanan about to go into the temple and ask an alms? And Kepha, fastening his eyes upon him with Yochanan, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Kepha said, Silver and gold I have none, but as such I have I give thee. In the name of Yehoshua HaMashiach of Netzerah, rise up and walk. And they took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Hallelujah. A miracle in the ninth hour. I hope you're reading the scriptures for yourself. Let's go back to the book of Acts chapter 10. So, Yochanan, Kepha, Paul. Now, we're going to have uh, someone from Caesarea, Cornelius. Hallelujah, the blessed Gentile. We're going to go to verse, uh, Cornelius was the one. Who, uh, let's read from verse 30. I think so. Hold on. Let me read. Yep, verse 30. And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house. This is a Gentile. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. Thine arms are had in remembrance in the sight of Elohim. That means in the ninth hour, your prayers are going to be heard for sure. 
No doubt, because it's here in the scriptures. And there's more chance of supernatural activity occurring in your life. Verse 32, send therefore to Yapo and call him a Shimon, whose surname is, is Kepha. Remember, simultaneously Kepha is praying at the sixth hour and having a vision. Then the Gentiles say, now we can eat pork, we can eat anything unclean. That was about other nations with nothing to do with food. And Kepha clears it up. It's not righteous for a Yehudi to mingle with other nations. But Yah told me not to call other nations unclean anymore. There's no, that, that's what he's saying. So here we go. I don't want to dive up. Ninth hour, Cornelius. Case closed. Now let's bring the spiritual element into it. Let's look at the death of Mashiach. Let's go to the um, Mark, the, the Gospel of Mark, Besorat Marcos. Mark 15. Please. Follow me in the word. Mark 15, 25 to 34. Okay, let's read from verse uh, 24. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. Morning sacrifice. Yehoshua HaMashiach Bless your name Yah And I bless you for your son Yehoshua It was the third hour when they crucified him and, of the, and the superscription of his accusation Was written over the king of the Yehudim And with him they crucified two thieves The one on his right hand The one on his left And the scripture was fulfilled Which says and he was numbered with the transgressors and they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Mashiach, the king of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. Verse 33, and when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Yehoshua cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama azabtani, which is being interpreted, my Elohim, my Elohim, why hast thou forsaken me? So guys, he was crucified in the third hour, in the sixth hour to the ninth hour darkness. Over the earth and the ninth hour he gave up his ruach, his spirit, making him the final atonement. Morning after morning sacrifice, evening sacrifice, afternoon prayer. All covered in your Hoshua's crucifixion. So now pray whatever time you want to pray. Even David says in the Psalms, I'll pray in the midnight hours, so I'll wake up early and pray. But there's prayer hours, according to scriptures, where there's blessings, supernatural activity, and anointing available. The third, the sixth, and the ninth. So we, there's a lot to this now. We've learned what's happening around us in prayer, or what's happening in heaven through prayer. We've learned to keep it private. There's a time to pray in the congregation, but private is the, is the way to go. So we never become boastful about our prayer life. We're learning that there's a frequency of prayer three times a day. Enoch, Daniel, David, Kepha, I mean uh, Paul. And then now we've understood that those three times have specific hours attached to them. The third, the sixth and the ninth hour of the day. Hallelujah. We now confirmed it by making our doctrine centered on Yehoshua. So we brought everything back to the cross. We brought everything back to Yehoshua. Hallelujah. And so now you know that there was hours of prayers and visitations of temples. How many times did Yehoshua go to the temple to pray? How many times did he go and speak a word in the temple? So you know he was observing these things too. So we've looked at um, the location. Um, we've looked at 
like times, we looked at frequency. Now let's look at direction. Uh, let's go to Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. But we'll just say, because we went there already, um, he opened the window and he prayed, he prayed towards Jerusalem. He prayed towards Jerusalem. Let's look at um, Psalm 5, verse 7. So Daniel prayed towards a specific direction. Let's see about David. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. And in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. This is David. This is Daniel. Let's look at Jonah. The prophet. The prayer of Jonah. So he's crying in the belly of the fish. Verse 4. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. So Jonah, David, Daniel. Okay, you're thinking Old Testament. Fine. But I want to continue with the Old Testament for a bit. Solomon, the dedication of the temple, 1 Kings. 1 Kings 8, 28. I love 1 Kings 8. The prayer is amazing. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 28. Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant, unto him, unto his supplication, O Yahweh my Elohim, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prays before thee this day, that thine eyes may be opened toward this house night and day even toward the place of which thou hast said my name shall be there that thou may hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place his name's in jerusalem okay the people living there are gentiles but his name is still there jerusalem will be trampled by the gentiles that's Yehoshua's own words so here we have um, his name is in Jerusalem That's where the temple was built Jerusalem's towards the east That is the direction we're talking about Let's look at uh, Abraham We'll get to the New Testament But we're building the picture out here Genesis chapter 12 Because people are going to say this is legalistic But we want prayers answered and if that becomes a ritual i want my prayers answered so whatever i need to do to get my prayers answered and that starts with making sure we've got faith and that's that no doubt in us and that starts what's happening within yeah and let's be really clear about it we're talking about having a circumcised heart first once we are walking in a circumcised heart in faith in purity we then can start moving with the outwardly things. But these outwardly things are, are very powerful, extremely powerful, ritualistic. But ritualistic things are good according to the scriptures. Abraham, our forefather, book of Bereshit, 12 verse 8, Genesis. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and hay on the east and there he built an altar to Yahweh, and he called upon the name of Yahweh. so he puts an altar on the east because he knows in heaven the altar is also in the east the eastern gate that's the book of ezekiel you can read that in the book of ezekiel um the tree of life is in the east of the garden you can look at the book of adam and eve chapter 28 and 29. let's look at the book of leviticus Leviticus chapter 16 uh, Verse 14 And he shall take the blood 
of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. The mercy seat of the Most High is in the east. Remember, this is a pattern of heaven. So when your prayers are going forth, they're going towards the eastern gate where his glory is. Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel details this. But it goes towards the mercy seat in heaven. The blood of Yehoshua, the mercy seat of heaven, is on the eastern side. Some of you might be thinking this is like too much. I'm showing you what's the direction of where your prayers are meant to be going. I'm showing you what's happening up there. The altars on the east side. So this you can confirm this in the book of Ezekiel, by the way. I think Ezekiel's chapter uh, uh, 43, verses 1 to 4. The glory of the glory of Yah is opened up from the eastern gate. Um the gate of heaven we'll go into that a little bit but uh, what we're saying right now is we're talking about the eastern direction so we have um, we have the mercy seat okay and he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins and so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remains among them in the midst of their uncleanliness Okay, he shall sprinkle the blood seven times, verse 14. So now Yehoshua is in the tabernacle of heaven. His blood is now covering us. Because we, we sin. It's transgression of the law. So we're still trying to learn the law. And as we're trying to learn the law, there's some errors we may make. So his blood covers us. And that's on the eastern side. In this, I'm trying to give you the importance of the east. You can read, where was the Garden of Eden? Eden was a, was, a, was a city. The Garden was on the east. The Tree of Life is on the east of the Garden. You can find that in Genesis 2a, Genesis 3.24. Numbers 2.3, the tribe of Yehuda was pitched on the eastern side of the tabernacle. They pitched tents in the wilderness. Yehoshua was coming like lightning from the east to the west. Yehoshua is the line of the tribe of Yehuda or Judah. So I'm just giving you an importance of direction. And we're again looking at glory. Because when you read the book of Ezekiel, his glory emanates and comes out the eastern gate. We find mercy in the blood of atonement on the eastern side of the altar. The mercy seat on the east. This is why we always, not always, sorry, it's going to be misquoted. This is why as often as we can, I'm recommending pray towards the east. Doesn't matter where you are. Abraham understood the east. We've got the understanding of the east now from the book of Leviticus. Now, and also I've told you in the book of Ezekiel, the eastern gate, the gate of heaven, Revelation 4.1. Let's go to Revelation 4 1. The gate of heaven. Let's go to the gate of heaven. Because that's exactly where we want our prayers to be. So uh, we've got to be right spiritually, but also when we're right spiritually, that should manifest in the physical realm. Revelation 4 1. Uh, and I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven, the gate of heaven. And the first voice I heard was it were of a trumpet talking with me saying come up hither and I will show thee things which must be thereafter and immediately I was in the Ruach and behold a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne and then the description of Yehoshua the gate of heaven uh, Genesis uh, 28 speaks about also like the gate of heaven so what we have is we have um, Jacob's ladder in Genesis 28 so Jacob saying there's angels coming up and down this is what I was saying when you're having your prayer time you will have angels carrying up your prayers and also descending with your answers or with a blessing or with a form of ministry in your life. So we are understanding these things and that place is called Bethel. We know this also because of Abraham in Genesis 12. Let's read Ezekiel 4, 4, 43. I want to read it because it's powerful because it sets everything up from what I said. Well, it sets everything up from what I'm saying. 
Ezekiel 43. Um, verses 1 to 4. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looks towards the east. And behold, the glory of Elohim of Israel came from the way of the east. And his voice was like the noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Revelation 4, 1. His voice is like the sound of a trumpet. His glory is coming out of the east, the gate of heaven. We see that with Jacob, we see that with Abraham. And it was according to the appearance of the vision, which I see even according to the vision that I saw. And I came to destroy the city, and the visions were like the vision I saw by the river Kebar, and I fell upon my face. And the glory of Yahweh came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. So the Ruach took me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of Yahweh filled the house. Eastward. This is powerful. Garden of Eden. East of Eden. Tree of life. East. In the garden. Jerusalem. East. Book of Enoch, chapter 60, verse 8 says that the righteous will dwell on the east like a, a, if i can go through all of these we'll go on for hours and hours and hours but i'm sharing these things with you for your own research as well um so now like we've covered it from like maybe enoch Lossberg and some some old testament scriptures we know that there's a specific direction to prayer solomon's temple will have been built in the east and um we know that the uh, in the book of Numbers as well, Moses and, and, the, and the children of uh, and Aaron and his children, they guarded that side on the east. The altars on the east always. We know that blood atonement, mercy seat on the east. That's why we are physically showing something that's spiritual by positioning ourselves. Okay, so some of you might say, am I driving a car? Should I look to the east? No, of course not. Say your prayers where you are. You are where you are. But if you're in a position where you can turn east, why not do it when we have all of this evidence? So now you want to know about Mashiach. Okay, let's go to Zechariah 14.4. Let's build a case for the east, for real. Zechariah 14.4 And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west and there shall be a very great valley and a half of mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south but the Mount of Olives is before Jerusalem on the east why have I brought up the Mount of Olives let's go to uh, the book of Naphtali let's get some lost scriptures in here I love the testament of the 12 tribes it's a very powerful book Naphtali 5 verse 1 For in the 40th year of my life I saw a vision on the Mount of Olives On the east of Jerusalem That the sun and the moon were standing still So Mount of Olives on the east Okay Let's now go to um, Luke We're going to go to the New Testament Because that is the request The book of Luke chapter 6 Please Talmudim, disciples that is, Kodeshim, saints. Okay, Luke 6, 12. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to Elohim. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples and them he chose 12 whom he named the apostles. He's gone to a mountain he prayed all night. Then he's calling the disciples. Shimon, who's Kepha, Andre, Jacob, Yochanan, Philippos, Bartalmai, Matityahu, Toma, Yaakov, the son of Kelef, and Shimon called Zelotis. And Yehuda, the brother of Jacob, and Yehuda Ishkeriot, who's Judas, okay, which also was a traitor. He took them to a mountain after praying and then ordained them. So there was prayer and ordination. So let's go to Matthew 28, 16. Because we need to know what the name of this mountain is. Then the eleven disciples went 
away unto Galila into a mountain where Yehoshua had appointed them, Mount of Olives. It's the Mount of Olives. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted, and Yehoshua came and spake to them, saying, All power given unto me in heaven and in earth. Hallelujah. They went into Galilee, into a mountain where he was appointed. This was the Mount of Olives. Where else can we go to? Um, Matthew 26, 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out, out unto the Mount of Olives. Then saith Yehoshua unto them, You shall be offended because of me of this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I am risen again, I will go before you unto Galilee. Kepha answered and said, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, I will never be offended. Yehoshua said, Verily um, I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Kepha said, thou, I, Though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee likewise, said all the disciples. Then cometh Yehoshua with them unto a place called Gethsemane. And say it unto them, sit ye while I go pray yonder. So the Mount of Olives is obviously a big place and within there is a garden of Gethsemane. So he's going to pray towards the east. Um, yeah, so the, the, this is Yehoshua frequently visiting the Mount of Olives. He frequently visits that place and he used to go and pray in that place. Let's look at um, some more lost scriptures. Okay, let's look at the book of the lost acts of the holy apostles. This is after the ascension of the most high. We're going to go to chapter one, the acts of Kepha, chapter one. Okay. Um, Let's go to, we're in chapter 1. Okay, let's read verse 1. <clears throat> Kilemes said, Thus spake my father Kepha, hearken on my son Kilemes, unto which I should declare unto thee, Our Adonai Yehoshua HaMashiach was on the Mount of Olives, and I was with him, and he had spoken to me and commanded me concerning all of the Torah. And he said unto me, O Kepha, go thou to thy brethren, call them unto me here. So I went down from the Mount of Olives, and I left our Adonai standing there, and I cried to my brethren, this is to say, to Jacob, or uh, Yochanan, or uh, Andre, and they cried out, the rest of the twelve apostles, <coughs> and to the seventy-two disciples. And we came to the mountain, we stood up on it facing towards the east with Jerusalem lying below us. Then a white and shining cloud was like unto a flame of fire surrounded us. And all the people of Jerusalem saw the splendor thereof and were dismayed. The east, they faced the east. Um, we can look at chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. And as for us, we remained on the Mount of Olives until the time of evening. And we prayed on the spot where we saw our Adonai ascend into heaven. And we also prayed. So he ascended from the east. And he's going to come back from the east. And we also prayed upon the place where the chariot rested and upon the place where he stood in the tabernacle where we had seen our Adonai. Then we the apostles came down from the holy mountain, entered into the city of Jerusalem, and we came to our lady Miriam, entered into our saluted her, and we made known to her concerning the ascension of her beloved son, who is our Adonai and Elohim, Yehoshua, our Mashiach, the son of living, the living Elohim, who hath existed forever. And every day, we, the apostles, used to go to the Mount of Olives at noon and at evening to pray there. The, the, the midday hour, uh, the sixth hour, and the ninth hour. And they go specifically to the Mount of Olives, which is in the east. They used to face the east. Where else can I go? Uh, chapter 15, verse 1. So this is still the, the Acts of Kepha. Okay, verse 3. And if he be dead, I will make supplication to Adonai. So this is, uh, careful, I'm going to raise someone from the dead. 
And if he be dead, I will make supplication unto Adonai to raise him up out of his grave, so that he may be able to see to talk with you before me. Then my master Kepha raised himself up and stood upon his feet, and he turned his face towards the east and prayed, saying, and then he went and prayed. He stood up and prayed. Remember, standing up. He prayed towards the east. And there's like another 10 or 15 scriptures I've got written down here. And the ascension of Yochanan. Also, he looked towards the east when he prayed. So guys, this is the case for the east. So we're going to keep recapping. We've looked at location, private. We've looked at frequency three times a day. We've looked at um, the hours of those three times, three, six, nine. And we've also looked at direction east, Jerusalem. And we've showed New Testament, Law Scriptures, Old Testament. We've also shown a pattern which is in heaven, the mercy seat, east. So now position. Positions, and uh, I keep it brief. There's many different ways to pray. Again, people will say, oh, we're forcing. No one's forcing to do anything. I'm showing you what's in the scriptures. So you have kneeling. Daniel knelt. Uh, we read that, read that in Daniel 6.10. He knelt, opened his window, prayed towards the east, and he did that three times. That's everything covered in one. He knelt, prayed three times, morning, afternoon, evening, and towards the east. <clears throat> so we've covered the whole thing in Daniel the prophet. So uh, you can also look at kneeling down in Acts 9.40 and Acts 20.36. Uh, I think you'll have Paul and Kepha there. So you can kneel. That's another position. Standing, as we just read in the lost book of Kepha, by 2 Chronicles 20, when Yehuda were about to be um, uh, overtaken by four tribes, um, they stood up and they prayed. Um, the prayer of Azariah, um, you will see that in the book of Daniel, um, that he stood up and made prayer. Okay? Um, you see a prayer of sitting down, David, in the second book of Samuel, chapter 7, verse 18. You also see David lying down in Psalm 63, 6. And then you see prostration, uh, which is like laying down flat on the ground. Uh, Mark 14, 35. In fact, let's go to that. Let me read one thing at least. 1 Kings 1, 47, Psalm 95, 6. So I'm giving you um, the scriptures. Let's read Mark 14 though. Mark 14.35 And so this is Yehoshua um, in the garden And he went forward a little and fell on the ground And prayed that if it were possible The hour might pass from him Hallelujah So I didn't go too much into too much detail about positions Because I want to do another teaching on it Talking about different positions For different types of prayers but I wanted to show that the positions of prayers are kneeling, standing, sitting down, lying down, prostration. I wanted to show direction of prayer towards the east. And that's how our prayers are received in, in the spiritual realm in heaven. I wanted to show you that um, you should be able to pray three times a day at three specific hours. Ex apart from whatever else you've got to do as well. Um, and the specific anointings and spiritual uh, revelations and supernatural activities at these times and um, remembering above all to keep your prayers as private as possible so uh, this is a brief study I hope you've enjoyed it may your prayer life now be edified I have showed you Old Testament law scriptures I've showed you New Testament um, rituals are good as long as they're scriptural there's nothing bad there's no bad rituals in this book at all um, we often think of ritualistic activities and legalism when we account it to the Pharisees and Sadducees. Remember, they never kept Torah. They never had weightier judgment. They, um, they added a lot of man's traditions. These were, these were what were binding people. And when we're talking about we're not under the law, because some people will say now, bringing these strategies into play or these methods, bringing people under the law, no. When we're talking about not under the law we're not under the law of sin and death anymore so the death penalty attached to the torah has been removed that's the era of grace now in the law of grace but obviously you've got to keep the commandments that's how we show we love the messiah nevertheless 
this is the teaching on prayer, to feel up, to, to have intervention, uh, to interpose, um, and there's a specific method to do that, that I want you all to be successful with. And the ancient fathers had success, the apostles had success. Hoshua, obviously, why not us in these days? Pray in any direction. Some people are going to say, all I need is faith. Yes, that's one element. That's the foundational element, faith. But there's other elements to this, which they used. And they were not ritualistic in terms of legalistic. You can't say Ezekiel was. You can't say that, that Yehoshua was. You can't say that Abraham um, and Jacob were. They just knew that this is the way that the Most High had ordained. Hallelujah. Praise the Most High, Yehoshua, and um, may we be filled with the Ruach HaKadosh always. Have a great Sabbath, and I'll see you again very soon for another teaching. Shalom.